Welcome to Emphasis Added, a podcast by the Houston Law Review, where we highlight legal issues with prominent lawyers and discuss the study and practice of law. I'm your host, Kevin Donovan. Welcome to the Law School Real Talk series with the Houston Law Review, where current students share their experience and advice on how to succeed in your first year of law school. I'm Kevin Donovan, and I'm joined here today with Natasha Kalaouz and Katie Liebel, and we'll be talking about how to excel academically in your first year of law school. Uh, Natasha, Katie, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Yeah, no, no problem. Glad to, ha- happy you're here. And um, so I, I kind of want to start. I chose both of you because I really, not, not, not just because I like you, um, I do, uh, but also because I think that uh, I, I know that you both were teaching assistants or, or tutors, TAs, all of those are kind of interchangeably the same thing, helped professors with classes. And so I'd love to start by just hearing what subjects were you uh, TAs for? Sure. Um, I was a TA for torts and contracts. All right. Yeah. And I tutored for, or TA, like you said, they're interchangeable, yep. um, for civil procedure and criminal law. Awesome. And then I, um, I was a teaching assistant with, with Natasha for, for torts and contracts. And then I also uh, TA for constitutional law. And so um, between all of us, hopefully we've, we've covered a lot, of, a lot of topics here and, and should be able to give some, uh, some good advice to some incoming students on uh, what to do, what to do their, their first year to hopefully, uh, hopefully do well and at least set themselves up for success. Mm-hmm. Um, and with that, I have, I have an opening question, uh, which is, uh, if you can think back, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of your first semester of 1L year? Mm. Definitely reading. Yeah. I I have never read so much in my entire life. To, to the to point of blindness. Yes, yes. Yeah. And and talking about how um, you know some students get little easels to put their books on so that you're not craning your neck down like this all the time. That's real because yeah. you were seriously reading all of the time. Yeah. Not, yeah. All, not all bad stuff. I feel like some some of it's interesting and yeah. good and and everything, but it's it's a lot of of reading. Really true. true. <laughs> um, I would say the first thing that comes to mind is the phrase, it depends, because I feel like I heard that from all of our teachers and just everything we were learning, there was no clear answer. It was just, mm-hmm. it depends. It's not like black or white. It was always gray. Which I, like. Um, I, like I liked it too, but it definitely was hard <laughs> to get used to at first coming from like, you know, like undergrad, you have multiple choice questions and there's A, B, C, or D, yeah. like it's a very clear answer. And so starting law school, the it depends, I feel like was definitely something I had to get used to. Yeah. Um, for me, I honestly like, this is going to be a bit of an image here, but I I felt like I was like being hooked up to the matrix and they were like (laughs) uploading me with like information because like, because of like, in part, like what you're saying, Katie, where it's just like so much information, like you're reading so much and like, I like to read, I I don't love to read, but like, I mean, that's just, that's the job and like losing your vision from it, uh, which it all comes back, but like most of it. Um, <laughs> kind of. And yeah, and just, and just like, you know, leaving like class every day, just being like drained, like you're just, you're like in a fog. I don't think 3L was, is nearly as bad. I don't think 2L was nearly as bad, mm. but, um, but yeah, just cause you're learning so much, it's just so different. And there's because of yeah. all those depends and all these different like nuances you have to learn. So yeah, it's definitely what they say. It's kind of like learning a new language at first, yeah. like even learning how to read cases, like what's important, what's not even some of the older cases and all their like 1800s language, it's like an entirely different language. So yeah, well, that is a, that is a perfect segue <laughs> because I, I want to start uh, this episode with talking a little bit about class preparation and like actually being in class and, and, and what that experience is like. And I think probably the first, the best place to start is with cases. And so, and and probably briefing cases, but we'll we'll get to that. But I guess first off, um, just to talk about what a case is, um, well, I guess, what is a case? It depends. Kevin, yeah, it depends, actually. It depends, it depends. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> I think in the, you know, when you think of cases in the casebook sense, it's yeah. typically appellate court opinions, mm-hmm. um, you know opining on some sort of legal question that the trial courts have ruled on. And so right. that review of that legal question, mm-hmm. um, but you know, it depends on, yeah. on what class you're talking about yeah. on, you yeah. know, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. They're, they're pretty much all like judicial opinions, like usually almost mm-hmm. all higher level and they're just like condensed. And then, but I think, well, well, before we get into the case briefing, do you remember the first case you read for law school? 
I don't remember the first one I read, but the one I do remember um, is Hawkins v. McGee. Okay. So it's like a classic contracts case and with the, hand. with the hairy hand. I remember yeah. that one because mm-hmm. I was like so grossed out by it at first. And mm-hmm. um, if you haven't read it, y'all y'all will as one else. But yeah. Um, yeah, I thought it's probably the first one I remember. Yeah. What, what about you, Katie? I don't remember my first one. I actually looked it up in, in preparation <laughs> and it probably was Strawbridge v. Um, Curtis, which is a Civ Pro case oh, really? uh, yeah, about yeah. diversity yeah. jurisdiction which i probably should remember that i had and, no record and maybe uh, maybe it did come back to me when when i started tutoring yeah. for the course but my go-to case um that i remember the first one i remember is um lucy v zimmer which is another contracts case about whether or not a contract is binding when um one of the parties is under the influence of alcohol. So oh. that stuck out in my yeah, brain. That, that's what that'll stick out. <laughs> but um, Useful information. Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. Exactly. I couldn't tell you whether what the answer to that question was, but yeah. I, I remember that being an interesting one that I thought was relevant. Yeah, yeah I think Natasha and I had the same uh, professors the first year. Yeah. And uh, it's funny, I guess you prep for contracts first. I think I had a friend who like was just like civil procedure is terrible. So like I read for civil procedure first, which is like Pinoyer v. Neff, like serving oh, process yeah. unnoticed. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, that was my, uh, that was my, my first one. But I, w- I want to move on from there to briefing cases because I know we've already, I, I, I know all of us, I think, have briefed cases at some point. And mm-hmm. so curious, how of the amount of cases you read, how many of those did you brief? All of them, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's not fun, um, but especially at the beginning, like you just don't really know what you're doing or what's important. So mm-hmm. I would just for repetition purposes would brief all the cases that we that we got. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if you did the same, but I, I did and, and still do, frankly, mm-hmm. in my third year. Um, I think for two reasons, mm-hmm. you know, they they are helpful if you're called on during class and yep. you know you can mm-hmm. relay you know i guess refer to them easily mm-hmm. to answer on call questions but also i think just going back if you read it and then you go back and you type it up you're already seeing that information twice mm-hmm. and so i think it's helpful you know throughout the rest of the course mm-hmm. that you can rely on that information and and just yeah. more um more time to analyze it so i think I, whether or not you're on call i think it's a good practice to to have yeah yeah, a professor uh, was asking about a class today. So my, I guess my first time in 3L, where somebody's asking about a case that was in the ca- and it was in was in the case book, and I was like, "Wow, like I maybe need to start like briefing these things again." <laughs> and so for me, for me, like all of 1L, like every single case briefed, um, yeah. maybe like torts because they were like really condensed cases. I wrote paragraphs about, but only in like the last month of class when I was busy doing outlining and other things that we'll talk about in this episode. <laughs> um, but but crucial. And so I guess we, we've kind of already talked a little bit generally about a case brief and it's, you know, it's, it's a summary of the case. It's those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. I also want to talk about um, just kind of what that looks like a little bit more in depth on mm-hmm. how to actually brief a case or kind of like, like case briefing 101. And so if you're listening on the audio version, uh, on the video version right now, you'll see um, a couple of like slides or documents that um, as TAs, we actually like handed out to students just to kind of see like what what a case brief actually looks like and so um N- natasha and katie will help me out here with a few of those things because i think for everyone you're going to have a few um of the same or pretty much all of the same areas i think right like mm-hmm. you're gonna have facts you're gonna have procedures you're gonna have the issue the holding the rule and reasoning and the disposition and so what do all those things mean um <laughs> we'll, we'll go through those uh, step by step, real quick. Um, I guess maybe Natasha, if you want, you help me out. What, what are what are the facts that you might have in a case? And you can use a hypothetical if you want. Oh, okay, sure. Um, <laughs> so the facts I would say that are most important are the ones that kind of pertain to what kind of case you're reading. Mm-hmm. So if you're talking about a contracts case, for the facts, the most important part will be like, did when did they make a contract? When was it accepted? When was it offered? Yeah. Um, those kinds of things. What were the terms of the contract? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, what were the parties? And it takes time, I think, to figure out what part of the facts are relevant or not. Yes. So I don't think I think you know err on the side of being over inclusive rather right. than under inclusive yeah. when you're first starting out. Yeah. You'll learn. You'll learn what like a legal legally relevant fact is. But yes. Um, hopefully the, the court opinions condense that, but sometimes, especially as a 1L, you do not get the most condensed opinions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I guess moving on to procedure, since, uh, Katie, you were a civil procedure TA, what, talk, talk to us about procedure. 
So I think procedure, um, you need to know where this case sits and the posture it sits within um, within the court system. So is this, you know, a, is the opinion of the appellate court um, based on the trial court's decision? Is it on a, is it a motion practice? I mean, it can be um, vary from different things, but that yeah. typically, um, you know, if you're I would say most, aside from strict like procedure case books, you're mm -hmm. oftentimes looking at, well, maybe evidence, but you're oftentimes looking at, um, you know, a, a trial court decision on the merits and then you're, you're right. looking at whether that's being affirmed or, mm -hmm. or, um, um, reversed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and often like procedure and like disposition, which we'll, we'll talk about in a second and even holding are, are going to be really, really short, you know, maybe a sentence, maybe a couple words. Normally your facts are going to be, you know, might be kind of beefy depending and then mm -hmm. your rules and reasoning will be more. And so just to kind of touch on the other ones, you know, the issue is, is going to be like, what is the um, what is the court looking at? You know, what, what are they trying to assess here? So if you have a contracts case, maybe there's um, some form of acceptance that, you know, has never been visited before. And that's why I like on it, like a lot of these cases are older because often mm -hmm. those are like the trademark cases. Like maybe you're looking at like when they send a letter in the mail when um mm. when is acceptance actually had and then the case the, the court will look at that they'll ask that issue and then through the rules and reasoning they're basically going to analyze that much like mm. you as a law student will eventually analyze things on an exam they're going to go through other legal rules and maybe compare them maybe they're going to look through some sort of like scholarly writing or other things the court has like decided on sometimes they're going to like look at the dictionary depending on the thing i mean it's it can get crazy, but that that's probably going to be where a lot of the beef of yours is. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to make some sort of holding, some sort of decision like that, you know, that issue. Yes, acceptances when um, when it's delivered, it's accepted acceptances when that, you know, letter is received. And, you know, we won't give it away. We won't give it away. What the mailbox <laughs> rule is. And then finally, disposition is basically just to the to, to the procedure. Like, did, was that lower court's decision? Mm -hmm. um, uh, like affirmed or did they reverse it? Or I don't know, maybe there's something else in there. I don't, I don't know. But basically, you're going to have those things. And, and Natasha and Katie, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, did you all have anything else really in there? Not really. I mean, but I would say, going back to the facts, another big thing that you wouldn't think would be confusing, but it is, is um, who's suing who, like who's the plaintiff, who's the to defend it. Mm -hmm. So I'd make sure to have those kind of separated out as well, because teachers will always ask you that when you're on call, you know, who was the defendant in this case. And sometimes if it's like on appeal, it's kind of hard to tell. Um, so I remember getting that wrong a couple of times. So. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think we actually had the same professor, like sit us down yes. and just be like, who here knows who the appellant is? And like, I still don't know who the appellant is. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why I'm going transactional. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, so yeah, it, it is yeah. great to, to know those things and mark those things out and kind yeah. of list the parties and who's, who's upset, you know, about what. And, mm -hmm. um, and yeah. And so it's, I think case briefing is the best way you can set yourself up for success. Mm -hmm. And so also on the video version, you'll see just a quick example with like, you'll see the highlighted versions of like fact issue and then a, a one page case, um, Noble v. Williams, which is essentially just going to have, um, those actually highlighted. And it's a really short case. So it, maybe it's not like the absolute best example, but it'll kind of just give you a feel for, all right, what should I be looking at and highlighting in my in my case briefs or in my like outlines um, and to go from there. But moving on, I know that was a mouthful. We won't talk about everything that much. Um, <laughs> but moving on, um, I want to know what you all think about uh, things like Quimby. And no offense to Quimby, but as a 1L, using some sort of like Sparknotes source or, or you know, condensed summary for cases. Did you use them? Did you not use them? What are your thoughts? I, I didn't use Quimby. Um, I didn't really use any outside sources. Um, I think one of the best pieces of advice I got as a 1L was how you're not just learning this subject, you're learning how the professor, this professor views this subject. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, unless it's really necessary or you need just like a quick refresher or maybe, frankly, you just didn't have time, um, I think there, I, I think you really try and capitalize on the materials that are given to you by your professor specifically. Yeah. For sure, echo that. Like that's <laughs> one of the most important things I think I learned too. Um, I did use Quimby though, but I used it as like kind of a safe check for myself. Mm -hmm. um, so I would like try and brief the cases on my own to begin with. And then if I wasn't super confident of like, if I knew what the rule was or if I wasn't, you know, the analysis part, if I had gotten kind of tripped up, then I would refer to Quimby to try and make sure that I had gotten what I needed to out of that case. Right. And that, that's, a, that's a good tool. I mean, I think Natasha, like you said, um, like 
learning like the law is like learning a language. And so if the more exposure you have to it, yeah. the better off you're going to be. And so if you're cutting ahead and just reading a one paragraph summary rather than reading like a court's opinion, then like you are just getting so much less exposure than people. Mm-hmm. And yeah, by the time you hit like 3L, 3LOL, some people call it, like maybe you're going to quimby a few things here and there. And also like, I mean, I think there was one time where I was like walking in a class and somebody like told me the reading for the day and I was like, wait, that's not what I did. And like, yeah, did I bust out Quimby then? So at least like knew, had some context of what was going on. Yeah. Sure. But if you start using it, like I think it's going to quickly become a crutch yeah. or at least it requires a lot of discipline to be able to like read the full thing, read it even two or three times, which mm-hmm. is often what I would do. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, and I think you all probably did the same and it's, you get that exposure and you start to learn things on your own. Um, mm-hmm. and it helps. And you also get to see how courts reason which is going to help you analyze things in, in exams, I think. Yeah, yeah, for so, sure. So supplements, it's probably a very similar question, but maybe not. Like, so, you know, like a lot of people have like the like constitutional law supplements or contract supplements, mm-hmm. um, ones that weren't assigned by a professor. Did you use them? Did you not? Kind of saying what Katie said, yeah. um, I would highly recommend that you're very careful with supplements mm-hmm. as a 1L. I did use one a little bit for one class, just yep. like to get a little bit additional information if I was really confused. but. It's like a hundred percent about how your teacher wants you to view a subject as opposed to just the subject itself. Um, so if you use supplements and you end up like, you know, saying something the supplement said that your teacher didn't say, or, you know, there's like, it's really easy to get confused and, and mix all the information together. So, and then your teacher will be very upset and you will not do yeah. well if you're like quoting the supplement instead of what they said. Mm-hmm. So I would highly recommend like being very careful before using supplements for yeah. sure. Absolutely. absolutely. And oftentimes professors will recommend supplements. I think in that case, right. absolutely. Sometimes True. they author supplements, right. which I mean, <laughs> by all means, Definitely read then. the supplement. <laughs> yeah. But if it's something that, you know, helps you brush up on something and they're great for learning the law, but mm-hmm. again, you're learning the law through the lens of mm-hmm. The professor that you're going to end up writing an exam to mm-hmm. so yeah. you definitely don't want to get too caught up on you know yeah. what everyone else thinks about the subject and like you don't have a lot of time and you're already mm-hmm. going to be overwhelmed and it's not you can't do everything like you're going to hear a lot of people saying they did certain things and you're not going to be sure what the right thing to do is and so yeah i think you know you can go down a rabbit hole of wasting tons of time on supplements as opposed to just reading what you're right. assigned. Because, I mean, you're going to be assigned so much reading anyway. Like, yeah. you'll be I, have enough to do. <laughs> listeners, you are, you are going to see a theme today, and it is time. And it is, yeah. you, there is, it's very Not limited. Enough of it. it no. as, as, especially as a 1L. Yeah. Um, and so I, I agree. Yeah, I don't think it's worth the time. I think that if you are doing all your reading and you're focusing and you're focusing in a lot of other aspects, like, cut, like trim the fat as much as you can while still getting everything you need Mm -hmm. to be able to excel like in the exam. Because in the end, yeah, do you want to learn everything? Sure. But like your future in law, at least like getting jobs and everything is going to, is heavily tied to grades. And in our next episode in the, in the law school real talk series, we actually talk a little bit more about employment. So if you're interested, watch that. But a big (laughs) thing we talk about is that even if you're the greatest person in the world, there are a lot of employers that if you do not have a certain GPA, they're just not going to look at you. And that's the unfortunate truth. And so that, that's really um, a big part of why this episode is, is quite important. And still, and for journals, which is another part of the series, um, you also have grade cutoffs. And so it, it's important to kind of start to put things in process now. And time management is, is definitely one of those that I actually plan on touching on more. But moving on from prepping for class um and all, on, all the, on all the reading actually one more one more qu- question i'm just kind of curious about prepping how many hours a week do you say did you would you think as a 1l you spent reading and briefing cases aka like just class mm-hmm. prep <laughs> a long time <laughs> um yeah at least double the amount that you're in class yeah okay at that's, least. A, that's a good reference yes I would every agree. waking moment yes. <laughs> every <laughs> waking <laughs> but um, i don't know that might be true. <laughs> yeah. No, it was a lot of time. I feel like, especially because you're learning this new skill. Mm-hmm. So it got easier, I think, as the semester went on. It didn't take as much time to read through a case or brief a case. At least, like, after your first semester, your second semester is a little bit easier. Yeah. Um, but at the beginning, I would say it was, it was a, long, a lot of time. Yeah. I would say, like, the preparation was probably a 40-hour work week. And I'll talk later in the episode about how yeah. I broke that down so it didn't feel that way. Mm-hmm. But, and then, I mean, you're, in, you have, you're doing 15 credit hours, so that's basically 15 hours in person in class. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, probably like 50-ish, mm-hmm. I would say, yeah. especially when I was learning it. 
Yeah. Yeah. But I would say there's no like one right way to do it. You know, like Mm -hmm. some people in law school do very well and they don't spend that much time. Maybe they just learn in different ways. So, but I would say that is about an average probably. Yeah. Yeah. I would say you're you're probably looking at a full-time job at a minimum. Yeah. You know, so, and which which is also advice, like maybe try not to, if you can help it, work a part-time job or anything else with it, especially at least your first semester Mm -hmm. where you really need to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you might touch on this later, but I uh-huh. think also the putting it together after class, I think is the more, yes. arguably more important than preparing yes. for class. So yes. I think I spent, hopefully spent more time because I think it was more important, intended to spend more time mm-hmm. with the synthesizing it after class and making sure I had the whole picture. So yeah, that's a really good point. As opposed to, you know, class preparation, okay, mm-hmm. in class, eh, you know, <laughs> and then <laughs> after classes, <laughs> the bulk of your time probably should be spent with the information yeah, after class. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, speaking of in class, I, I guess we'll move on to that next. Before we continue, a special thanks to our sponsor, Vincent and Elkins, a global law firm with 11 offices and more than 700 lawyers committed to excellence in serving and advising its sophisticated clients in industries such as energy, finance, technology, real estate, media, and beyond. v lawyers are also proud to support pro bono clients across their communities. To help clients navigate complex areas of law, v hires the best and brightest law students and lawyers, valuing diverse perspectives and backgrounds. Visit www.velaw.com to learn more about v summer associate program and hiring opportunities. Start your success story at Vincent and Elkins. Speaking of in-class, uh, I'd like to move on now to actually being in class. And I think everyone knows the, the most anxiety inducing part of being on class is being on call. And so uh, we'd love to know if you all remember your first time on call and, uh, and what it was about maybe. I absolutely remember. I <laughs> couldn't tell you what it was about, but um, I had a pretty notable Socratic method, avid Socratic mm-hmm. method professor um, for civil procedure who I ended up DAing for and, and really enjoyed, but he'd make us stand up and I, I remember thinking, wondering if my classmates could see the sweat on my back because I just <laughs> remember being, and I don't, I don't get, typically get super nervous and I couldn't have told you what it was about, but yeah. it, it truly was nerve wracking because he, um, he's a little bit hard of hearing as well. And so you had to yell your answers yeah. and be really confident about yeah. it. Um, but needless to say, I mean, it was, it worked out fine and, mm-hmm. and you, you know, you're probably going to get embarrassed in class yeah. at least once you're one all year, but mm-hmm. does that matter at all? No, not at all. Yeah. 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 I don't remember the first time I was on call. I do remember being on call in civil procedure um, mm-hmm. as well, just because I was super nervous and like it was, well, actually, so I, um, you know, prepared for every class and was like, thought I was prepared for that class and I got into that class and you kind of didn't know when you were going to be on call and so um he started like calling on random people he called on me for one case and then we kind of moved on and he called on someone else um and then at that point I realized that I had missed so the page ended at the bottom and then the top of the next page had one more case on it (laughs) and I hadn't read that one because I hadn't seen it um somehow and so um, I just remember the rest of that class period, I was sitting there like, oh my gosh, please don't come back to me for like this last case because I will not be prepared for like, you know, and it's so frustrating because you prepare every day and yeah. like, the one day you're on call is like, of course. Um, so I recall that anxiety and being, but he didn't come back to me and we actually like ended class and it went okay. So I got really lucky, but I recall that experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I had, um... I definitely remember my, at least one of my first two experiences. I'm not sure which class, it was probably in civil procedure as well, because that seems like what it is. But I remember um, my first time on call in contracts with, uh, with, with Professor Dow, who's, who's on the podcast. Check out his, <laughs> uh, his, his, his episode on uh, the Texas death penalty, the Texas death row. Um, but uh, his episode aside, a professor Dow's awesome professor, but definitely the kind of professor that, that keeps you on your toes on call and you, mm-hmm. and you never know who, who's going to be on call. There's no rhyme or reason. Mm-hmm. Um, just classic, classic old school way there. And I was so thankful that it was like would be uh, Lucy Lady Duff Gordon, which <laughs> which is just like the, I think, I think we ended up calling it like the first influencer and her agent. And mm-hmm. so I was like, oh, I actually remember that case. Like I actually kind of like that case. But the thing with Professor Dow was he would never tell you if you got it right. He would just move on. Mm-hmm. And like, you're like, did I move on? Cause like, he's just done with me. Like, cause I didn't get it right. Or, and you just kind of sit there. I think, I don't know about you all, but I think pretty much everyone like 
when they finished being on call, like we'd like after class look to their friends and be like, did I do that right? Like, did I screw up? And <laughs> for sure, I thought every word that came out of my mouth was like not English. Like it was horrible. Kind of yeah. blacked out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did full full blackout. Yeah, for sure. So um, so yeah. So don't don't worry about being on call. I think I think it's if I would say that my number one tip is like if your briefcases, which we've already talked about. I don't know if you all have any other cases other than that and breathe. Um, any other tips? But I think. It's all you can do. That's Just right, hope yeah. for the best. Yeah, um, yeah. And everyone's gonna like mm-hmm. make mistakes. And know everyone's nervous. Truly. Exactly. Yes. And the professors yeah. understand too. So, just do your best. That's all you can do. And then you know, learn from if you make a mistake. Right. Right. Moving on from being on call, I think probably the only other thing you're doing in class other than being on call or, or being concerned about maybe being on call is taking notes. Mm-hmm. And so I'm curious if you all had any sorts of strategies or, or thoughts on how to take notes, especially as one L. A lot of notes. <laughs> I, I erred on the side of more rather than less, um, but I, I think it's so dependent on who the professor is and and what kind of learning. Um, I I learn best by putting it all, all the information together after class, and so I felt like the more information I was able to get from class, I could kind of piece what was important and save that part. I think we'll talk about outlining later, yeah. um, but save that part for an outline, and that was really um, the important things. But um, I would also I don't know, you kind of have to find the balance because you don't want to be so ingrained in, in getting every word um, to the point that, you know, you're missing some valuable class discussion. So mm-hmm. uh, I think it's it's kind of a delicate balance. Right. I wrote down everything the professor said, really? like literally every word. Um, I was in a job before law school where I had to like transcribe what people were saying. And so that was just something I did and I think it helped just because at the time I didn't know what was important and what wasn't. Right. Um, and so like having at least everything down on paper allowed me to after class be like, okay, was that important? I don't know. Um, but I, yeah, I basically transcribed what my teacher was saying. Yeah. That's <laughs> it was a um, little much, but I was like, right. No, I, I think, I think, I think what both of you are saying is, is really true in that, like as, as a one all, like you've never outlined before, you've never taken an exam before. And so it's really difficult to like, know like or just have any sort of like really intuitive feeling about like oh this is likely or this is likely not Mm -hmm. i think a few things for me like points that like i was like oh this is definitely something they want one if it's like in bullet form in a summary on a slide Mm -hmm. probably important if your if your Mm -hmm. professor is that nice to do that for you like take that down Mm -hmm. but i think a lot of times a lot of professors will be pretty clear about the rules but they won't be clear about the analysis Mm -hmm. i think that's what a lot of like first year people kind of miss in the first their first time going through class is they're like, this is law school, so it's all about the law. Mm-hmm. And so like all I'm gonna focus on is the rules. And like that can work if the analysis it comes like really easy to you. So like for me for torts, I was like, yeah, like analyzing these facts to like battery is just like, yeah, did they hit them? Did they intend to harm them harm them or hit them or contact them? And it's like, I can figure that out. But like, I mean in, in other sorts of like instances, it, the analysis can be kind of tricky. And so mm-hmm. like oftentimes like focusing on how the professor is kind of walking you through that Mm -hmm. with often through hypotheticals and stuff can help you know what is what are they going back to a lot and asking about because those are probably important things or what are they repeating um those sorts of things for for note taking i personally strive to um to caution myself on less notes Mm -hmm. but i agree with you that as a first year it can help to take more so long as you're you're riding that balance of am i still able to pay attention? Am I not mm-hmm. thinking about the last thing they said rather than the current thing they said? And that's something else I wanna talk about is how important do you think it is to be present in class versus other things like doing classwork or outlining after class? Where do, where do you think that balance falls? Or is it just do it all? <laughs> I would say it's the most important thing yeah. um, personally. I, I do think outlining is important too, but like class time is really valuable because it's the chance that your teacher's telling you basically what they want you to put on the exam. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that's definitely the most valuable like right. part of law school, because if not, then you would just read the book and then you'd be able to take the exam, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I definitely think the in-class piece is important, especially what the professor says. I, mm-hmm. I would definitely caution anyone to take too seriously what their classmates say. And I mean, that, True. that discussion True. is good. And I think like you mentioned, mm-hmm. if a professor keeps asking certain questions and that sort of thing, but you also have to understand that, you know, not, at, not everything that is said in the classroom is correct. So you kind of have mm-hmm. to um, understand that. But I think the, 
I really focused on the after class yeah. piece of it too. Mm -hmm. But you needed that valuable in class information mm -hmm. to be able to understand how to organize it after class too. So mm -hmm. I would I would probably rank the piecing it all together is probably the top mm -hmm. priority for me at least. And then with in class specifically professor discussion um, being a close second and then preparing for class important but probably would fall to third rank of, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> of priorities. <laughs> no, it's exactly what you're saying I think is, is a common theme because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm agree with both of you. I think I, I tend to agree a little bit more with Natasha on the in class is probably the most important just because hopefully like outlining is actually the most important which is mm -hmm. after class but that's like at least as a 1L, it's probably like a couple months after like your first class mm -hmm. where, cause like in the beginning, it's just like everything's so new. It's like, you know, what, what notes you're going to take. But like, I think what we're, all of us are saying is it's not the prep for class, which I think mm -hmm. a lot of people I've realized get lost in that is they, mm -hmm. they stay up all night trying to figure out these cases, trying mm -hmm. to like digest all this information because they're, you know, really concerned about being on call or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then they get to class and they're exhausted and they can't focus. Or like they've been in the library all morning and then they go to class and they're like, they're already tapped out. They've been in the material for way too long. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think the best thing, the best takeaway from, from this is like, yes, do your reading, do your briefs, but don't do it to the detriment of your ability to focus in class. Cause some people are prepared and they like go to class and they don't even like, they, they, they're not focusing. And so they, they get on call and they read the case, mm -hmm. but they don't know what the question is because mm -hmm. they're just like lost. So I think that is probably the biggest takeaway there. But I want to talk about one other thing about being in class mm -hmm. and that is participating in class. And so how important do you think it is to participate in class beyond when you're just getting directly called on? I think that's very professor dependent because, mm -hmm. and I would read the syllabus closely. If that's mm -hmm. a portion of your grade, mm -hmm. probably speak up a little bit more. Mm -hmm. If it's not a portion of your grade, you know, if it's, if it naturally helps your ability to pay attention or, you know, you just can't handle it, you need to ask this question, then go for it. Yeah. Um, but I, I think, you know, you can rely on your personality and, and what, if you, if you learn fine just by sitting and observing and that's not a portion of your grade, then, mm -hmm. you know, I think you're just fine sitting there and observing. Right. Yeah, I would agree. I think like being engaged is enough, like unless it's part of your grade, like you said, um, because you can be engaged and still try to like walk through the hypotheticals and figure it out on your own and you don't have to be necessarily like speaking up about it. Um, and I do feel like, like you said, people are just different and, and learn differently and internalize differently. So if you're not naturally someone who likes to speak up when mm -hmm. you're processing, like you really don't need to feel like you have to do that for right. sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, I think what both of you are saying is great. Like, yes, especially if a professor says it's a big part of the grade, like take that seriously, but mm -hmm. Otherwise, I mean, but often like it's almost always the exam is what I found in law school. Like even if it says that, it's like it's always the exam. Um, you know, <laughs> as long as long the biggest yeah, as long as long as you yeah. are like when you are on call or prepared. Mm -hmm. But I think being I think what you said, Natasha, is great. Like being engaged um, in just like actively in like what you're saying too, Katie. Like just actively like being ready to participate or like mm -hmm. thinking about participating is going to keep you on top of the subject. It's going to make it easier when you're on call. But it's also just going to keep you focused, like have an answer in the back of your head for the questions because mm -hmm. we're thinking those things through it through. It's going to be so much easier. I mean, I think the class I did the worst for in law school was the was one class where like I like at like had an outline and I was just kind of like I already knew like kind of what was going on. And I already like was like not actively engaged, not actively paying attention to the class. And then like it was just really hard to put it all together in the end, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. And but I would and, and like and also I would say. You know, I think a lot of people worry like, oh, I don't want to be a gunner or, uh, or, I, or uh, am I a gunner? I don't know. Maybe I'm a gunner. Maybe I'm not, right? That's how broad your definition is. Yeah. It depends. But I would say, <laughs> I would say participating is great if you're helping your classmates because like these are all people that you're going to probably work with later in your career. So if somebody's on call and they're just sweating and it's a professor that'll let you hop in and help them out, mm -hmm. help them out. If you're asking questions at the end of class <laughs> because you want to show the professor how smart you look, like that might be a place where it's like, you can probably ask those after class and not hold mm -hmm. up everyone else's time. So that's probably the other, like if you're worried about like, am I going to be a gunner or not? I would say that's a, those are like a fine line of like a good place to help and be like a little more enthusiastic mm -hmm. versus like maybe a place where like you could probably wait till after class and like not hold everyone up and, and really delay things and stuff. So. Um, Should we define what a gunner is? For do, do you have a definition? <laughs> I mean, no, not really. I was <laughs> hoping you but, did, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I do, like, I, I remember I never heard that term before coming to law school. Um, yeah. Oh, gosh, a definition. I know. Yeah, I mean, I think 
people, it, 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 it all depends, right? I think like yeah. what, what a gunner is, is going to vary. I think for some people, it's just anyone that tries, right? Which is, mm-hmm. I would say is a bad definition. Like you wouldn't consider yourself a gunner then. I think where I am like, yeah, like that's probably somebody who is like a, like a no crap gunner would be somebody that's like, look at this really interesting question I read in a supplement, like, you know, yesterday and, and like, I'm going to ask this sophisticated thing. And it's like, clearly like just nowhere near the scope of what we're trying to talk about here. Mm -hmm. And you're just kind of like wasting people's time. And that's where I'm like, yeah, that's probably a gunner. Or like also like the person who's like always participating and not even giving other people a chance. I think if you've participated, Mm -hmm. hold back, wait to see what, if your class is growing up. But like, if you can move the class along, Mm -hmm. like people trying to move that class along. (laughs) People know, if no one wants to get called on like, and you have an answer, help people out. Yeah. That's what I feel. I would agree. I don't think it's like, I don't think anyone who participates is a gunner. I probably was at certain points, but I feel like it's someone who maybe participates like more than the average Mm -hmm. or like, but like way more than the, you know, not just like. It's just yearning to get answers out. Yeah. (laughs) To to be heard. Yeah. But yeah, but I I, I would say if, um, if you're worried about being a gunner or not, like don't worry because again, like we've talked about, like grades are important. And if that helps you do well, Mm -hmm. like do well. And that's what we're going to talk about next is a little bit more about grades and in particular the curve. I think a lot of people have no idea what the curve is. They don't know how to navigate a curve or what that means for their, their grades or year or how they should interact with others. And so I'd like to start and just ask, what is the curve? <laughs> it's this mythical, yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's um, a mandatory grading policy basically mm-hmm. that each, um, each class needs to end with a certain grade point average yep. um, to facilitate you being graded against your peers, yes. basically. So, you know, there might be half of you deserve an A, while well, half of you can't get an A with the class mm-hmm. average still being, what is it, a 3.2 to a 3.4 or something yes. like that. Yep. Um, then you'll have Here, to... Here, it's school dependent. School dependent. Yes, but yes. yes, for U of H at least. Uh-huh. Um, so, yeah, basically facilitating a, a uh, grading against your peers scenario yeah yeah which doesn't necessarily seem fair um because (laughs) you know like if everyone deserves a's everyone should get a's in my opinion but i do understand that they need some kind of way to like your first year of law school um yeah like just grade like they need some right and some like law schools don't have it as well yeah 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 it's 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 a metric that employers demand and i think yes if you go to like any ivy league school like some of them don't have curves and Mm -hmm. it's like well, yeah, because like employers are just going to hire anyone from that school maybe, but mm-hmm. like, I'm pretty sure like there's like well over a hundred, maybe 200 schools that aren't Ivy League schools. Right. And you know, there are a few that don't have grades, but even those ones that don't have grades that I'm aware mm-hmm. that aren't like Ivies, mm-hmm. and even, even I think Ivies, they just have a different name for grades. Mm-hmm. It's just like a high honors and an honors and mm-hmm. it really is just an A and a B. Um, and so, so grades are there and I, I think they're, they're important because of employment. And I think that's why like, that's why the curve probably exists is because em- employers demand some way because otherwise mm-hmm. like, yeah, but most people in law school are like bright enough that they did well in the LSAT. They probably did well in undergrad. And so like, prof- and professors would probably just give most people A's. And so mm-hmm. employers would have no way to differentiate and apparently they care about that enough. And so you have, <laughs> you, you have curves, <laughs> but like from a, from an employment standard uh, standpoint, I mean, or, or maybe other sorts of things, is there anything you can think of where it's like, you should care about where you fall on that curve, why it's important? I think it's important because it can give you opportunities. Like I do yes. think it opens doors no matter what type of law you want to get into. Um, I don't think, you know, it's like the end all be all like, you know, other things are more important than grades and like other things, you know, like your personal mental health and other things are more important. Um, but I do think like as far as job opportunities go your first year, it does like open doors easier than they would be if like you weren't on a curve or something like that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I think I think any anything's possible, right? Like right. I have a good friend that didn't do well his first year in law school and continue to push, continue to excel through. And like three days before he took the bar, his firm <laughs> that he wanted to work for, like reached out to him and gave him a job. That's awesome. And like, but like that's a stressful couple of years in law school where he didn't have something lined up that he wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And so I think for a lot of people, like if you can excel, especially your first semester of 1L, mm-hmm. it's gonna be a lot less stressful. If you can't, mm-hmm. there are so many paths and there are definitely employers that grades aren't as big of a deal. Mm-hmm. And then you can work your way to where you wanna be if you don't get the rate right away. But getting good grades from the, from the get-go is a good shortcut. Mm-hmm. And so I just, I, I wanna make that known for people who are wondering, okay, why does all of this matter? Mm-hmm. But I think 
Also, um, I think the note is, I mean, we've already kind of seen like, you're graded against your peers. And so disclaimer, I, I don't think like, I never sabotage my peers. Is that, <laughs> <laughs> not, not that. There, there's movies about that, yeah. right? I n- never did that. Actually, we had a, I mean, Natasha and I were in the same section. I think yeah. we had a pretty cooperative section. Everyone mm-hmm. kind of like helped each other out. Right. Um, but I do think there are a few things that you should probably just keep in mind in a curve. And so the question is, who should you trust? <laughs> or maybe not, you know, not in that language. But, you know, you've got professors, you've got teaching assistants, you have your peers. Where does that kind of work out? And maybe I'll, I'll start with your peers. Um, did you do um, like peer study groups or anything like that? I did not. I think okay. um, something that's unique to law school is it's very autonomous. You know, mm-hmm. you really can navigate without you know obviously you you want to develop those relationships with your classmates mm-hmm. both you know if you miss a class you need some notes like you got to have those people you can rely on right um but i think for me it was more coming back to that theme of time again i i don't know that i had time to be able to you know meet with a group about this versus this you know there's so many other resources that you can um, you can use so i did a lot of you know studying on my own and then leveraging teaching assistants as mm-hmm. well as professor office hours yeah I um definitely did I'm like such a people person I feel like I just like had to have a bunch of people around me all the time um to just you know sometimes vent to I think that's like one really good benefit of having a study group is if you're really like struggling with something or frustrated about your day like everyone understands Natasha rolled deep (laughs) (laughs) Um, but I also think like a really important resource like like you know advice to take is for people who've been in your shoes before so Mm -hmm. two l's three l's that like you know either learn in similar ways that you do or like did well or had things that worked for them so i met a lot with like older people at u of h and just asked them kind of what worked for them right um and i do think that was really helpful like i got so much advice that i used so yeah Yeah, absolutely i think i probably side more with katie but a little between I think, but exactly what you said, Katie, I think is, is in my opinion, the most important thing when it comes to study groups or, or even talking to TAs and professors is it's all about time management and it's all about like, you only have so much time and so you need to use it in the way that's best for yourself, which, which you're saying too, Natasha, is like, you need to like see what's gonna work for you best. But also I think when you're in a big study group, I mean, you made it work, you made it work, but like <laughs> you have, way more people that you have to, that you're probably going to end up helping out that have like different things, you know? So for instance, probably most people in law school understand like 70% of the subject, right? Before the test or 80%, um, as like an average. But if you have 10 people, those, like all of those different 20 or 30% might not overlap. And so the more people you have in there, the more likely you're going to be like redundant in explaining things that you understand that wasn't easy to them. Whereas if you only have two to three people, you can all still fact check each other. You can all still help each other out and explain mm-hmm. things, but you're not going over the entire class right before the exam when there's only 20% of the class that you actually need to know, especially when if you're talking to those people throughout school and like Katie's saying, after class maybe, mm-hmm. you know, getting together with them and, and working through those sorts of things. And so that's that's kind of where I was at. I had I had basically two others, maybe a third person that like I was running a lot of things through, really just two people. Um, and like after we took practice exams, we talked about them after we did before class, we talked, Mm -hmm. I think that helped a lot. And was it, I think it was more for a time thing than like, I'm graded against all my peers. I think Mm -hmm. that the curve will, will likely fall, but there are ways to kind of help mitigate and give yourself more time to help yourself out more. But with TAs and professors, I guess, on the other side, what did you use them maybe specifically for? How do you go, how do you recommend approaching TAs and professors for help? I think if you're just like confused about a general area, it's mm-hmm. a good um, idea to go to a teacher's office hours or a TA's yes. office hours. Um, definitely don't go in and be like, I'm confused about everything. I mm-hmm. feel like sometimes that doesn't come across well, but yeah. like if you're confused about one little area or um, you maybe missed something that you couldn't easily get from like a peer, then that's how I would use them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think um, I would go in with a list of questions mm-hmm. as specific as I could. And, mm-hmm. and sometimes even if you didn't have time um, yeah. to uh, to go into office hours, maybe even send an email with mm-hmm. a list of questions. And then mm-hmm. that way, the email that they send back has, you have record of that. It's not just a discussion. And so you can, you know, use those with your notes and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And um, as well as practice exams, if there's any... Uh, professor written I wouldn't necessarily go searching for practice exams but if there's anything that you can practice questions maybe there's just chapter 
practice questions in your book. Mm -hmm. If you ever do any of those, um, running those past the TA and then maybe even the professor if they're willing to look at them mm -hmm. and getting written or verbal feedback um, early and often on that type of style of answer, um, it would be really helpful too. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. I, I I mentioned I was gonna bring up practice exams a little bit more later, but I mean I agree with you. Like practice exams, if you can do them, like they are incredible. How many? So if there, I, I had a hyper. I'll ask it now. If you had, if there were ten practice exams given to you, how many of them would you do for a class? Ten. Ten. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes. so there was one I think where there were I think we had like fifteen, and I, I did like six of them. I think it's it's one of those. But I did a lot of them, right? Mm -hmm. And if there were like four or five, like I would do them all. You know, take that time because that is really where you get the best feedback, mm -hmm. especially if a professor or a TA is willing to go over them, which is kind of the, it depends on my side with that advice is it depends on the professor and the TA and like, is it the kind of professor who's just like always going to be elusive in their answer? Because like, that's just like, they're just can never turn off the Socratic. I'm probably not going to talk to them, you know, because it's just not, it's just not going to be worth your time. You know, you're just going to end up sitting there a little bit more frustrated and that's whatever, at least if they're consistent with all your peers, they're getting the same thing. And also with a TA, if it's the kind, you know, there are some TAs, I think most, especially in our school, I, I liked almost all my TAs, but there were a few where that, you know, it's more like I'm here for the credit, you know, we got credit hours and like, I'm just using last, the last year's review sessions. And it's like, you know, you need to, you need to be conscious of your time and don't go to a TA's review sessions if you understand everything, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, like torts was an example for me. Like I said, like I came really easily, me easily to me, and I liked RTA a lot. Mm -hmm. But I, but I understood torts, so I was like, I'm not gonna go to these review sessions, except like maybe the last one where she, they're talking more about just exam tips, because like there's nothing I needed to brush up on, and I would rather take that time for other classes. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I think time management in those aspects, knowing those people, but using them for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially for practice exams, getting mm -hmm. that feedback is huge, and outlining if they if they'll look at your outline. Like, Mm -hmm. Do it. Yeah. That, yeah. That, is the, that is the key to the castle if you can get a good outline. I mean, geez. <laughs> yeah. Mo moving on to law school exams in particular, I think um, the first thing I'd like to ask is uh, what does a typical law school exam look like? Because it's not the same as undergrad. No. <laughs> no. Um, I feel like, you know, it depends obviously on the teacher, but most of them have some sort of like issue spotter, which I guess we kind of explained what that is. Um, and then some also have multiple choice questions mm -hmm. as well, but usually not many. And usually the multiple choice are a lot longer than like, it's not a clear answer either. Yeah. It's like, you have to kind of do some analysis before you get to the Absolutely. conclusion. Yep. Katie, what is, what is an issue spotter? <laughs> issue spotter if you will. is a mess, to be it's honest with you. It is, a it's, fact meant, it's meant to be a mess. Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. and I picture law professors uh -huh. getting the biggest kick out of writing these exams. <laughs> some, some of them definitely Well, do. and a lot of them will have themes. You know, yeah. it'll be talking about sure. famous people or, you know, drop in names of colleagues or, yeah. you know, yeah. just current events. But yeah. um, basically a long fact pattern of uh -huh. a big scenario, depending on the class, um, in which you're supposed to read this and look through and find the legal issues. So yep. you're literally spotting the legal issues. Um, so there's, you know, depending on the on the question, there might be a call to the question. There mm -hmm. might be a, you know, mm -hmm. state any call, uh, causes of action that you see in this fact pattern for yes. like a torts exam. Uh -huh. Or it could just end and say, discuss. You know, right. it can be right. very open-ended. So yeah, um, yeah definitely just a, a big mess. <laughs> <laughs> It, 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 and, and moving on to how you how you answer that mess, because that's there, there's a certain way that most professors are going to want you to answer that mess too. So so like both of you said, it's it's this crazy you know mess of stuff that's basically there to test everything you learned that semester. And it and part of that that test is spotting the issues. And so normally what you're going to do is is to answer exams is is something called IRAC I R A C issue rule or like like a court reasoning. Um, anal or rule analysis and conclusion. And so most professors are going to want that. Some will say they don't care, but inevitably like you need to spot all those things. And so even if they don't care, like you still need to state the issue that you're addressing. So mm -hmm. say it's a tort thing. And, and again, going back, like there's a, there's something, a battery or it's like crim and it's a murder, you know, you're going to want to like, that might be your issue. Like was when X like made contact with, with Y like battery. And then like, from there, like you're gonna state the rule for battery, which is which is the rule or like the, the law portion of that. And that's like, for a lot of people, like they state that and they're like, good to go. But really like the points are in the analysis. Mm -hmm. And so you gotta go to the A of that. And that's where you're taking that rule 
and you're applying it to the fact pattern. And so, you know, in that fact pattern, you're going to have like, they didn't actually like really contact them. They pulled a chair out from under them and then they fell. And so, and you know, and they, they can get really convoluted. And so there might be things in that issue spotter that like you didn't like you maybe initially wouldn't look at and think to, but that's where that analysis is going to come out. Mm -hmm. And it's going to like really get you to apply things the way that your professor wants you to, to show command of the material. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing is the conclusion. And from everything I've heard, like they're meant to be very gray, these issue spotters. And so normally like they don't care. Some, some professors are like, don't even state a conclusion. Yeah. I don't care. <laughs> and then we, we had a professor like that. It was kind of weird. Yeah. And, um, and I think, I think more often than not, like you just got to make one side and maybe like, and this is why. And I think another important thing about this, like issue spotters is that they are point based. So it's not like, yes. you know, it's not like there's a right answer. It's just basically how many different points you can get. And some professors give you points if you mention case names and some right. don't. So you kind of need to act, like really ask your professor and make sure you understand what kind of points they're looking for. Yes. That way you can maximize your points. For sure. I would say if your professor doesn't say it in class, like mm -hmm. you should ask your TA or ask the professor, mm -hmm. figure out some way to know how are they grading. I think it's a fair question to ask unless they just tell you that like, you're, they're not gonna let you know fair question to ask mm -hmm. and then also once you figure those things out you want to outline to that mm -hmm. and so i'd like to move on to outlining we've, we've kind of alluded to it a lot throughout this episode yeah. what is an outline I, <laughs> I would say it's just like a summary of your in class notes out of class notes like book no you just like everything that you're learning it's kind of like a condensed summary i don't know Absolutely. I think, yeah, a, com a combination of everything that you've gathered over the semester that you think is relevant in a format that will be digestible to you yeah. mm -hmm. and, and maybe accessible because oftentimes you can use them on exams um, if they're open book or open outline exams. So, yeah, um, which that's a whole nother ball game. <laughs> well, I, I, I was going to ask, yeah, how, how does that differ? Like, how, how do you think that differs? So if you have an open book exam versus a closed book exam, how is your outline going to differ in, in length and in just overall material? I mean, what does that look like for you? I think I, my outline would probably be the same regardless. Mm -hmm. um, but if it was an open book exam, I would probably have a shorter outline or like mm -hmm. kind of a cheat sheet attack mm -hmm. outline, some yeah. people call them, mm -hmm. that you could use quickly that, you know, if you just needed a little refresher on a topic, you could turn to it quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and But also have a larger outline that if you needed all of your notes or information on, you, mm -hmm. could, you could refer to that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree. Yeah, I think, I, I know, I'm pretty sure you do this. I mean, I think most people do this, and this is a really good thing to know what you're mentioning, like an attack outline mm -hmm. versus an outline versus your notes. And like the, the classes I've done the best in, it's like notes, 80 pages, and then like outline, like somewhere between 20 and 40. And then a attack outline, like almost always less than 10. Mm -hmm. And so I think for me at least, and, and maybe some other people feel the same way, like condensing the information, like, again, like gives me command of that material. Mm -hmm. And especially like when you're doing practice exams, you can test that attack outline and be like, okay, I don't even, I never use this. So maybe mm -hmm. I should take it out. I'll have a more condensed thing to look through and be able to reference in an open book exam. Mm -hmm. Or like if you're memorizing things, you might realize like there's a lot of stuff in my notes that I, that's redundant or I don't need to memorize or, you know, doesn't apply. Mm -hmm. So also for attack outlines, I think like putting it in the format that you would want to answer an essay or like an issue spotter yes. in. So like, yes. you know, in class you might go over topics in a different order than you would answer it on the exam. Like for example, civil procedure, you know, like mm -hmm. you would start probably with some kind of standing, like depending on right. the teacher. And so like you might necessarily not learn standing first, but mm -hmm. on your attack outline, you probably want to put it first if that's how you would answer the question. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Absolutely great point. Um, also, I think another, another thing that might come up for people, and I'm just curious if you both have advice or tips on this, is when a professor says like, you only have a one page outline front and back, what do you do? What do you, how do you condense that? And I know, I know Natasha has an example. I don't know if you have an example, Katie, but tell me about torts, Natasha. Oh my goodness. Cause we did basically the same thing. I don't know if I would recommend this, um, but I, recommend I, it. <laughs> I, recommend I basically it. just put all of my outline as much as I could on a sheet of paper, tiniest font possible, could barely read it, like had a headache afterwards. But I mean, I did, I, well, and I guess I did like kind of highlight sections. Like I used a lot of color coding so I could find things quickly and I like practiced with it. Um, 
but I, I put as much information as I could. I think that's humanly possible on <laughs> a sheet of paper. And I did, I did maybe a little bit less, but like, I mean, I, I don't know what my overall was, but I remember like when I had condensed everything that I thought like I probably won't readily remember this without an outline, like the rule statements and everything as well off as I could get, um, it was eight pages. And then I took that and I made it into three columns we, so we could use a front and back sheet. And that was it. That was the only rules, right? Mm -hmm. the professor said nothing else. So I was a little concerned at first. Yep. But I took, I took that and it was like three columns. And then all of it was like size six font, with, which I'm pretty sure Tasha also did. Um, and then like with like, with like size three point in, as the spaces between like paragraph, like paragraph breaks. And then like bolding things to help differentiate. Like because there's just so much text, but you need to... You need to like make it digestible and things, mm -hmm. you know, in some way or another. And so like, like line breaks and just like things that would take up the minimum amount of space. And you'll be surprised. I mean, really, like you could probably fit eight pages of Times New Roman mm -hmm. onto a single face, moving the margins all the way out. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what did I do? You know, like being concerned, I went to the professor's office hours. It was, it was actually one of the only times I went to a professor's office hour that, that semester um, because I use TAs a lot more. Um, and I just like pulled it up just to like be like, yeah, I had a question here. And essentially the professor um, was like, is that your outline? And I was just like, all right, here's it, here's it. She's going to tell me it's okay or not. And like yeah. three days before the exam, I'm like, yeah, is this fine? And she's like, yeah, I just don't know how you're going to read that. And I was like, cool. Don't you let me worry about that, right? <laughs> so, like secret magnifying glasses yeah. in my pocket. Yeah. I definitely yeah. think you had to like practice with it before though. I definitely would recommend Absolutely. practicing because you couldn't just do you that. And lost. then, yeah, you, like you couldn't just show up and just try to navigate it the day of the exam. You definitely had to yeah. practice. Yeah. Get that outline set yeah. and then mm -hmm. practice. And I guess that kind of leads to another question of mine is when would you start outlining? Unpopular opinion, but... <laughs> I would start outlining the first week of class. Yeah. <laughs> but that's I, a good, I mean, it's a good strategy. Then, well, it's not I mean, bad. kind of along with the theme that I've, I talked about earlier is I think putting it together after class was, that was my biggest concern. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't feel like I could digest any more information in the next classes if mm -hmm. I didn't have that organization from the classes that we'd already been through. So, mm -hmm. um, but I, I know plenty of people that successfully wait until I think October was kind mm -hmm. of like mm -hmm. a, a rule of thumb, mm -hmm. but um, I, I found that the earlier the better for me. So I would like, I also started like after a week or two, but then I ended up not knowing what I was doing. So I had to go back and redo it. So I would probably, if I got to do it over again, maybe start like three weeks in. Yeah. Um, it will take you like a really long time. And so I definitely like consistently would outline like throughout like every week or every two mm -hmm. weeks, like whatever your system is, definitely do it on a consistent basis. Don't just do it like once a month or something because it'll take, you won't be able to do it. Um, but yeah. I definitely like would maybe say wait a week or two to kind of get your bearings before mm. you start. Unless, I mean, or you could just, like I ended up just having to redo everything and maybe I learned it better right. by having to do that. I don't know. Um, now, what about using outside outlines or, or commercial outlines? Did you use them? Do you recommend it? Obviously we're talking about, because so, so disclaimer, like some professors won't allow it. Some professors don't care. Some professors mm -hmm. like might even encourage like, hey, there's actually some good commercial outlines out there. But in the instance that you could use one, um, would you use it? Would you not? And if so, like when? I would only use an outline if it was for that professor from someone that mm -hmm. I trusted or yeah. someone that knew somebody that I trusted. You know, mm -hmm. you don't want to use an outline from someone who didn't do well in the class. Mm -hmm. Yes. And Huge advice. I think, a theme, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think a theme throughout too is, you know, classes are so professor dependent. Yep. Um, so I would definitely stick to something that either your professor has recommended mm -hmm. or is specifically for that professor's class. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and even so, I would never use those as my, like if it was an open book exam, mm -hmm. I would never use that as my outline mm -hmm. that I took into mm -hmm. the exam. So I think um, the only time I've, I've used others outlines, which have been verified yeah. professor dependent outlines, uh, would be to compare my own that I've yes. compiled throughout the semester and then it, as a great study tool to just go through the two, you know, a couple weeks before the exam and just make sure you've you've hit everything or everything kind of tracks with that that right. other outline. But yeah, absolutely. Could not have said it any better myself, yeah. like literally. Um, I will say the class that I like did use an outline a little bit, like someone else's outline a little bit more for, I did the worst in. Yes. So I would, like I definitely would say if you can help it, mm -hmm. try your best not to rely on other outlines, even though it might be like a quick way to get the answer you're looking for, you won't fully understand it as well. Yeah. Um, but definitely like echo everything she said too. Sometimes it's really a great resource. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it can certainly be a crutch. And that's why I asked the mm -hmm. when is like, I would wait, right? Mm -hmm. Right, like at least, at least go through a little bit of the class and kind of see, you know, get your own, your own like thoughts and things, mm -hmm. um, especially like later in school. I mean, it can't help when you're outlining to see an outline mm -hmm. and to see like, how do people organize? And you could probably just look at any outline just to see like, how does, how do people, I mean, again, like somebody who did well is, is what, what you're trying to look at, yeah. but like, how do people organize their thoughts? Um, but yeah, other than that, like if you can get one, that professor, highest grade or, or something like that, or an A, um, if there's anything less than that, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend using it right mm -hmm. at all. And honestly, like I, I, I have like almost always completely built my own outlines mm -hmm. because it's just like, you learn so much in that process. You digest the material, you know, and even if it's an open book exam, you know where to look. Mm -hmm. It's like, I think I agree with you, Todd. I think the, the, the class that I used an outline for like more heavily, like leaned on more heavily was like my worst grade in mm -hmm. law school. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. Um, but they, they can be useful, especially to check yourself. So, you know, not saying like, don't do it. If the professor allows it, like mm -hmm. can be a tool to use, but that it is just a tool in your tool belt. And mm -hmm. there, are, there are many to use. Right. I think even like a teacher syllabus can be a helpful tool when you're first trying to figure out how yes. to structure your outline, yeah, really like following point. their um, their structure can be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And like you're saying too, once you take an exam, maybe moving some things around mm -hmm. to like, oh, like if we talked about like offer, like second, like that's mm -hmm. probably the first thing I'm going to talk about in a contract, mm -hmm. you know, or something like that. If that's mm -hmm. what your professor likes. Yeah. So we talked a lot about a lot of things, <laughs> law school, we talked about... <laughs> Prepping for class, going to class, outlining exams. Now I just want to talk about um, some general life hacks. Mm -hmm. And so just curious if, if you all have any things you did day to day outside of just normal law school or just over or things you wish you did um, to make your life, to make life a little easier, maybe to free up some of that time or, or whatever. I mean, what are your life hacks for law school? I would say get a schedule and be consistent. Yeah. Um, you still need time to like decompress and you don't want to always be like, you know, watching TV while studying. Cause I feel at least like everyone's different. But for me, I was, if I was doing that, I was either like still slightly stressed because of law school, but also mm -hmm. not doing good work because I was watching TV. So I tried really hard to separate the times. Um, so I would partially to beat traffic cause we live in Houston. Um, but yeah. I would like try to get at the law center around 7 AM and mm -hmm. I would leave around 7 PM. And like after that, I didn't do any schoolwork. Like when right. I went home, I like was completely disconnected, like did my own thing. Um, I would work on the weekends as like study on the weekends as well, but not as much. Um, yeah. And I would try to kind of like separate, like I would always try and do my schoolwork at school as opposed mm -hmm. to doing it at home. I think that helped me a lot and sleeping a lot. And like definitely recommend you don't try and pull all nighters at any point because you will not learn what you need to learn <laughs> if you're doing yeah. that. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Like sleep is so crucial. That, yeah. That's one of mine that like so many people don't understand. And mm -hmm. I mean, I, I won't get into like a whole like personal trainer, like health thing like, right now. <laughs> But just like a few things, like don't sleep with the TV on. Like that's like that's not good for sleep. That's not good like sleep hygiene. Like I mean, there's a lot of other things you can do. Don't have like a lot of, like don't have a lot of light in your room. Sleep in it in like a cooler temperature. Um, sleep in a quiet area or have white noise. Like you, you there's a lot of ways you can optimize. I didn't sleep. know all those ways, Kevin. Yeah, so, <laughs> I, was, I, was a, I was a personal trainer in my past <laughs> life. Um, but I mean, there's just like there's a lot of things you can do to optimize sleep. That's gonna help so much because like you learn in your sleep, like your memory improves if you sleep well. Mm -hmm. um, and so many people trade sleep to find balance in law school. Mm -hmm. And like you've gotta, especially before exams mm -hmm. and and those sorts of things, like you've got to sleep. Mm -hmm. But I'll talk a little more about balance in a sec. I'm curious, Katie, Katie, what do you think? I think you have to be the same person you were before you went to law school. So mm -hmm. if you, for instance, I go to bed at nine o'clock, mm -hmm. I wake up at the crack of dawn, but I go to bed at nine o'clock. Yeah. And so in law school, if it was within my control, I don't, I didn't let school keep me up past my bedtime mm -hmm. or, you know, you have to, you have to continue doing the things you love. I love mm -hmm. to exercise and run. So I kept yes. that as part of my schedule. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, if you played an instrument before law school, still play your instrument. So right. find times to time to do those things. Mm -hmm. Um, intentionally mm -hmm. and and that way you don't feel guilty about spending time away from from school either because mm -hmm. yeah your, your time is going to be there's going to be more stress on your time but mm -hmm. as long as you set those boundaries early and mm -hmm. keep them and like you said keep a schedule yeah um and consider who you are before law school you're mm -hmm. still the same person you're just a student now yeah. as well. <laughs> and kind of going 
off that, it's not like a sprint, right? Uh-huh. It's more of like a steady walk, I think. And so, like you were saying, if you kind of start with that mindset from the beginning, um, you can still make time for all the things that you want to do. Right. Um, and, and I think it's important to use that, like those, those pre-life hobbies and things that you had, mm-hmm. like as tools, like again, like another tool in your tool belt to like be able to de-stress and just like mix up the monotony. I mean, we talked about like the amount of reading you're gonna do, like your neck's gonna hurt, your eyes are gonna like start to blur. Like if you <laughs> if you read like two to three hours at a time instead of, you know, eight or 10 hours straight, and then you like, and, and of course, like I think with Natasha's advice, like if you have to, if you have a long commute and that's the best way to manage your time, then that's a good way to do it. But like if you're working from home, you're doing your homework at home, like work out and then go back and study a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Do the dishes, like hang out with your spouse or significant other, mm-hmm. and then go and do a little bit more studying. I mean, there are a lot of ways to do it and you have to figure out what works for you. Mm-hmm. But for me, like I would use that balance, but also like, remember it's balanced. So like run, but like maybe if you've never run a marathon before, like maybe your first semester in law school isn't the right time to train for a marathon, mm-hmm. right? Like. Work out, but don't work out three hours a day. Um, and, and the same thing with things that like people know you should probably have in moderation. Like, go and have a drink. Like, go to a recruiting event and have a drink if you drink. But like, don't have like ten drinks. Don't like, don't go so crazy that you're going to be super hungover the next day and you're not going to be able to study. Even with like taking caffeine, you know, like don't drink like, you know, fifteen cups of coffee like every day. And like, even on the weekend if you're not studying, you know, like try to balance in those sorts of things. And I think you're gonna you're gonna see a lot better results, and you're gonna see that those are helpful rather than harm you. Oh, the other thing is like watch it, watch an episode on Netflix, but don't watch the whole series. I actually can't do that, so I just didn't Maybe. watch Netflix. Yeah, <laughs> can't do it. Can't do it. Yeah. Um, I think I think it's it's been great having you both on. I have one question that I, I'm asking everyone in the series, and so we've given a lot of advice here. Um, and if you could narrow it down to one piece of advice that you could give to a first year law student, what would it be? I would say, remember why you went to law school and use mm-hmm. that as like, cause there's, it's gonna be tough. You're gonna have like sleepless nights sometimes. You're gonna be really stressed out. And I think something that always helped me was just like refocusing on why, what was important to me, why I wanted to come to law school. Um, you know, I would commute a lot as we mentioned. And so I would drive by like the city of Houston every morning and every night when I was coming and going. And for me, that was kind of like a reminder each day, like, okay, I'm working as hard as I can now to try and get like a job afterwards, you know? Right. And so I think that was the most important advice someone actually gave me when I was a 1L. And so yeah, pass that on. <laughs> yeah. How are you, Katie? Very similar. Uh, I think beginning with the end in mind is kind of, my probably the best piece of advice that was given to me too mm-hmm. and and knowing where you want to be in three years and mm-hmm. both professionally and personally so you know professionally if you came to law school because you want to have xyz job well then make sure along the way you're doing all those little things that will set you up for that job right. but also per- personally like mm-hmm. in the three years do you want to you know not have a balanced life or have damaged relationship, you know, all of those things, like make sure that's, um, also you're making those decisions on a daily basis, looking at that big picture and looking at what that end goal is. Absolutely. I think for me, touch on a little bit. I, I've actually, I will touch on it in every episode cause I can't have the same, I have to have the same one piece of advice, <laughs> but like, I think everything we've said today has all like really narrowed down to like time, right? Like what can you do to prep? Like everybody is on the same timeline and that is you're going to start like late August, early September, and you're going to have finals late November, early December. And like, that is what you're working against. And so time management is so crucial, I think. Mm -hmm. And like doing some of the things we've talked about in balance can help manage time, like not binge watching Netflix, for instance, like that's going to give you some time, but also like looking at your life and looking at the day to day and seeing like, where am I losing a lot of time? that I'm not. So like for me, for instance, like I knew I loved to go to the gym, but I also knew like one, I commuted to the gym and you know, maybe you're losing 20 minutes there, one, 10 minutes each way. Also like, I love to like talk to people in the gym. And while I liked all the people in the gym, like maybe, maybe some relationships needed to go and they weren't going to be like my marriage. Um, and they probably weren't going to be like my, like my very close friends and maybe just like chatting with people, uh, when I was hopped up on pre-workout wasn't the best use of my time. So like, I, I like had a garage gym set up. And when I first had it, like it was really small and it's like grown because like I'm obsessed with it. Um, <laughs> different story, different episode, probably different <laughs> podcast. Um, <laughs> but I think like 
that like mapping out your time and seeing where is it going to get coffee like huge time suck you can make coffee at home um or meal prep i think that's a huge one right like i mean in in time it really just correlates with energy too like Mm -hmm. focusing your energy and your time on school and on the things that matter and wherever that priority list is for you Mm -hmm. like making sure that like those things are where that's allocated and it's not allocated to stuff that really you can go without and especially that first semester maybe that first year I promise you there's there's a uh, silver lining and you will <laughs> you will get there eventually but like take this time and if you're watching this episode and you're not a first year law student yet start those habits now mm-hmm. like ma- figure out and manage your time and figure out those skills way ahead of time because like that is just going to be so useful your first year and it's also going to be useful when you're an attorney practicing because so, so I've heard it's, it's a lot of work. <laughs> and like, if you have to spend time on something, for example, commuting, like I yeah. was commuting at least an hour every day um, for law school, like make use of that time in a way that's beneficial to you. Like I right. really was able to learn how to decompress and like sing along to songs and yeah. do things with my time. So if you have to spend time on something or if you enjoy cooking, you know, use that as a stress reliever. 100%. Like every drive I did, commute to school, like I did phone calls with like family and stuff. Mm. And like, that's how I kept in touch. Cause I knew like when I was reading, like, I was probably not pick. I mean, I, like, if they call, like I'd like answer really quickly. But like, I wasn't like pulling myself out. But like, I made sure to keep up with my relationships doing that. Or when I like, I like did the dishes or these other things. Like keeping up there is just mm-hmm. it's the way to do it. You got to be efficient. Mm-hmm. So, yep. Anyways, I, thank you so much, Natasha, Katie, for being on the show. Uh, it was great to have you. And um, yeah, it's been a pleasure. Ho- hopefully, to see you in school. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having us, Kevin. I'm sure we'll see you around. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Emphasis Added is a podcast by the Houston Law Review. If you like what you heard, subscribe to us on YouTube or your favorite podcast app and follow the Houston Law Review on social media or check us out on HoustonLawReview.org. Till next time.